My mother told me that she actually thought of naming me Philip. So maybe that was prophetic, I don't know. But thank you for that. Very kind and generous uh, and uh, I think undeserving um, introduction, but thank you for that. We love so much Pastor Richard and Yolanda. We got saved in the same era. We're from the same litter of disciples in Tucson under Pastor Warner and what a great blessing to have our spiritual father, uh, Pastor Warner here. I got saved 48 years ago uh, in his living room flash forward to here tonight, who could have ever imagined and who could have ever thought, and I concur so much with what Pastor Ruby said, we must not, we, we better not take this for granted. I was in the uh, Nogales conference uh, earlier this week, Monday and Tuesday, I ministered there, uh, now here in uh, San Antonio, Pastor uh, Greg Mitchell and Pastor Tom Payne are preaching in the conference in London. And I suspect that by Friday night, when all these conferences are buttoned up, we could have 40 or 50 new churches planted in the fellowship. Amen. So I think this will be a historic week for our fellowship, not just for uh, this conference, but for the others uh, that are happening. So be praying for them as well. Turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21. There's a little bit of a story behind this sermon that I want to take some time, a few moments to share with you uh, in my introduction. This is the most exciting time to be alive. Events are happening around the world and we see what's going on in Israel now that are changing and advancing the landscape of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. We are in the final stages of Jesus coming for his church. It's all coming to a head right now. I don't know if we're going to finish this conference, and I'm serious about that. God spoke to me last week, early in the week, to preach a sermon on Jesus coming again. And I felt very inspired about it. I didn't know how I was going to go about it. I uh, had just read the text that we're going to read now in my devotional Bible reading. And so I was thinking about this text and trying to grasp all that Jesus was saying and trying to communicate. And the idea behind preaching on Jesus coming again was to sound the alarm for my church because I fear that too many of God's people are not alert. They're distracted, they're diverted, they're not looking for the imminent return of Jesus Christ for his church with urgent anticipation. Therefore, if you're not looking for it, you're not going to be preparing for it. And so I felt very inspired about this. So I told Renee about it on Thursday. And as I'm starting to write the sermon and put it together, I just feel the Holy Ghost. Spirit of the Lord is inspiring me. Sermon is flowing. And I told Renee two or three times, I said, honey, this is going to be a good message. I can't wait to preach it on Sunday morning. And so Friday afternoon, I went home. I study either at home or uh, in my office at the church, but I went home to finish the sermon, and I finished it at about 7 o'clock in the evening this last Friday. And then Renee wanted to take a drive and get a coffee. We do that quite often, and we use that opportunity to talk. And then Renee's phone started blowing up. I didn't know this until Friday night. But when she was visiting my daughter and her husband and my three grandsons in Tel Aviv, Israel, one of my grandsons put an app on her phone. And the app sends an alert every time a missile is fired. And I hadn't heard it. Renee hadn't said anything about it. And her phone is going off like those Amber Alerts. One 
after the other, after the other, after the other. And it puts a map of Israel on her phone. And I'll show you the picture right now. It puts a map of Israel on her phone. And pretty soon the entire map, you can put the picture up. When I say put the picture up, that means put the picture up. Oh, it's there. <laughs> no, that's not the picture. I wanted the first picture of Israel, that one. That's the first picture we saw. And Renee's looking at her phone, watching the map of Israel turn red, and each of those little tags is a missile. And she said, Paul, Israel's being destroyed. What's happening over there? And her phone is dinging and dinging and dinging and dinging over and over again. So I pull over. She's, we're both. And so we call Carrie. They're alarmed. I can hear the sirens going off in the background. They're going into their safe room in their house. They don't know what's happening. But we found out shortly thereafter that, and your pastor preached a great message on this Sunday morning, that uh, Hamas had launched over 5,000 missiles uh, into Israel uh, in an effort to destroy and uh, 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 to put them uh, off the face of the map as they are desiring to do. And they sent those missiles uh, in a 20-minute period of time, 5,000 missiles. Uh, they began to uh, enter into the territory of Israel, uh, going from house to house, killing uh, and taking hostages. And then the second picture that I want you to see there. That happened today. When I was walking into pastor's office at 10 o'clock this morning, I opened up my uh, iPad and I have that app on my iPad and it's going berserk. This is a missile launch that took place today. Probably over 500 missiles were fired from the north from the terrorist group Hezbollah. So they're getting it from the south, from Gaza, now from the north. And what was being said in the news the last couple of days, that Hezbollah was holding back because Israel was uh, launching a massive counter assault. And so people were saying, well, Hezbollah is holding back. Not anymore, they're holding back. This was just today in the north of Israel, uh, right around the area of, uh, of Haifa. And then the other map, I think, do I have another one? No, I don't have another map. So when I'm talking to Bob and Carrie on the phone, this is what Bob and Carrie and Max and Robbie and Jack heard at 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. loud and what that means is when those alarms go off uh, throughout the entire nation there's this alarm system throughout all the streets uh, everywhere people live you're to get off the streets pull your car over go into your safe room uh, and then you tune into certain news sources uh, and find out what's going on and when I talked to Carrie a little while afterward uh, she said dad this is the epicenter this is the real world this is the center uh, of what is happening in the world and what God is doing and as she's telling me that I'm hearing in the background it, and Carrie said dad it sounds like thunder over and over and over again. I can tell you that Bob and Carrie are safe right around their neighborhood. Uh, there's a military outpost. There's about 40 to 50 soldiers stationed in the streets right below the apartment building where they live. And there's a perpetual movement of his troops and soldiers. And so I ask you to pray for them and believe God. But I found out all of this after I had finished writing the sermon on Jesus coming again. We are witnessing, beloved, in real time, the rapid advance and fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And the recent events that I'm describing here represent a major escalation in that regard. The nations of the world are aligning. Iran and Russia, Syria, Qatar, Turkey, even some members of our own Congress are calling Hamas and Hezbollah freedom fighters. They're blaming Israel for the war. We are swiftly marching toward, and I'm, this isn't hyperbole, beloved. 
We're swiftly marching toward, you can read Isaiah 17, where Damascus is going to be destroyed. That's where Hezbollah is headquartered. And Ezekiel 38 and 39, the pulling down of Gog and Magog into Israel. We are very possibly right there. I want to preach a sermon I've entitled Sounding the Alarm from Luke chapter 21. Follow with me as I read it and try to imagine what Jesus is saying here and what he's trying to convey. He is sounding the alarm for us in this generation. And I hope we can hear it this evening. Jesus said in verse 25, there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Then Jesus said, look at the fig tree and all the trees when they are already budding. You see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighted down with carousing, with drunkenness, with the cares of this life. That describes a lot of God's people, weighted down with the cares of this life, eyes not upward but downward. That that day comes upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I want to talk to you, first of all, about signs. The text details a very specific way that God works. He works through signs, not billboards that are signs that advertise a product, but God created signs so that we can see what's coming in the future. God created the biological world, for example, to function on this principle. God put signs in place to show us what is coming before there were clocks or calendars, or the knowledge that we have today. Signs were the means that farmers knew when seasons were changing, and when the seasons changed, they knew that that had to trigger action on their part. It's time to plow. It's time to sow seed. It's time to irrigate. It's time for the rain to come. It's time to harvest. There were signs that presented themselves so that a farmer would know what he had to do going forward. Your physical body produces signs. Sometimes those signs tell you that something is wrong. You feel a pain in a weird place in your body. Lasts a day or two, then goes away. You don't think it anymore, but then it comes again. And it's more intense. That's a sign something's wrong. Something's off with your physical body. And sometimes those signs are enough to save your life. They're a warning that you need to take some action. In verse 29, Jesus told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they're budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is near. 
That's how they knew. A burst of warmth caused the trees to bud and flower, and the farmer would know that summer's coming, it's springtime, I have to plow, I have to sow seed. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Jesus is talking here about the certainty of his return and how we are going to know that it is imminent. All the signs that Jesus spoke about are in place today. I am capable of forgetting things. So are you. Have you ever forgotten a birthday or an anniversary or an important event? We're capable of forgetting things, and when you forget about something, you don't prepare for it. You can't. You forgot. And it seems to me that a lot of people have forgotten that Jesus is coming. Not living in urgent anticipation. Not taking advantage of every opportunity, even every altar call to get as thoroughly right with God as we can be. 1,800 prophecies in the Bible predict Jesus coming. 318 of them are in the New Testament. One out of every 25 verses in the New Testament. One quarter of all uh, scripture uh, is prophecy. Half of those prophecies, more than half of them, have already been completely fulfilled with 100% accuracy. We have confidence that everything Jesus said would happen, will happen, has happened, and is going to happen. Prophecy, signs to make known what is to come. So let me talk to you about some of those signs. When I wrote this sermon, Israel was just a kind of a blip in the sermon, and it's a little more of a blip now. (laughs) But first of all, Jesus talked about distress of nations with perplexity. There are a lot of factors playing out in our global stage today that are unique. One is the rise and the emergence of dominant China as a superpower. Their goal is to become the preeminent superpower in the world. They are referred to in the book of Revelation as the kings of the east. One commentator said nearly two centuries of decline, after nearly two centuries of decline, China has been emerging as Asia's new epicenter of industry, trade, and military power with the world's largest army and ambitions for greatness and expansion, China is poised to claim a position of world dominance and its resurgence will have ominous consequences for the West. That is happening right now as you and I are seated here. Along with this is the diminishing stature of the United States. Another commentator said America... American decline is the idea that the United States of America is diminishing in power. All you have to do is look at the political landscape to know that there's a diminishing happening. United States of America is diminishing in power on a relative basis geopolitically militarily, financially, economically, and technologically. It can also refer to absolute declines demographically, socially, morally, spiritually, and culturally. There's been a debate over the extent of that decline. And whether it's relative or absolute, shrinking military advantages, deficit spending, geopolitical overreach, And a shift in moral, social, and behavioral conditions have been associated with America's decline. The ascent of China as a potential superpower emerged as a central concern in discussions about the decline of American influence since the late 2010s. And some scholars suggest that China has the potential to overtake the United States' current position as a world-leading 
superpower. So that shift is happening now. That's unique. There is, of course, the continuing, ever escalating, and this is what I wrote before I knew what was going on. I wrote continuing and ever escalating threats against Israel. Continues to dominate the news. 24 7 coverage about the war in Israel. Now, Fox News, CNN, all the major outlets uh, uh, all over the world are covering this. All eyes are on Israel. And day to day, we're going to see a shift in how that news is being presented and how uh, we're hearing what is going on there. And I just keep hearing my daughter saying to me, Dad, this is the epicenter. This is the real world. This is the center of what God is doing. It sounds like thunder. And Carrie told me this morning that the bombing uh, that's taking place uh, uh, in Gaza, it ricochets, the sound of it bounces and ricochets off the ocean. Gaza is right on the coast. Bob and Carrie live just 34 miles away from Gaza and they can hear a constant rumble all day long. The current war in the Ukraine has resurrected talk of nuclear war. If you pay any attention to news, President Putin has been rattling the nuclear sword for a few years now. One article called The Whale of Death put up picture number four. The chilling moment came. Nuclear incoming. The siren sounded and school kids wearing gas masks in war drills as Putin readies Russians for World War III. Chilling footage, this just happened last week, shows school children being taught how to don a gas mask. Sirens were sounded in all regions across Russia's 11 time zones. It was Russia's first nationwide defense exercise as Putin indoctrinates his people about the danger of the West uh, triggering uh, World War III. A recent poll of 6,200 Americans conducted by an organization called bonusfinder.com said that 71% of Americans say they have no faith in the United States government to prevent a doomsday event. And over half of them believe that a doomsday event could come within the next year. There's the explosion of technology in the last 12 months or so, and all this talk about AI, artificial intelligence, uh, the increasing of the ability of the government uh, to overreach uh, and control people's lives. There is nothing, there is no purchase that you can make, uh, no Google search that you can do, uh, no, no, nothing that you do online that is not known or cannot be known. Those of you that spend half your life on uh, wasting your time on social media, all of that is known. You're not just posting, uh, uh, you know, your latest uh, item that you purchased or the latest meal you ate uh, uh, to your buddy. Uh, it's out there and all of that information can be cultivated uh, and it can be exercised uh, and it will be necessarily exercised uh, by Antichrist when he comes uh, in order to control to the degree that he will. Distress of nations with perplexity. Secondly, Jesus said, men's hearts failing them for fear. A recent article, this is picture number five. Why are heart attacks on the rise in young people? Young people are more likely to die of heart attacks post-COVID, a study finds, but why? Young people are not supposed to die of heart attacks. They're not supposed to have heart attacks at all. There are a lot of things that could, there are a lot of things that COVID can do to the cardiovascular system, blood clot formation, inflammation in blood vessels. It seems to also cause in some people overwhelming stress, which puts stress on the heart and has caused a spike in blood pressure, a 30 to 50% increase in death of heart attack among young people. Verse 26, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. 
There's a mental disorder now called doomsday anxiety. People are going to emergency rooms and they're going to their doctors looking for help and looking for medication to calm their nerves and to help them cope with the fear that is gripping people. Third sign is lawlessness and violence. Major American cities have become war zones. This is unique in the last few years since about 2020 and it's incomprehensible. Social media driven mob rampages in Philadelphia, Los Angeles, San Francisco and Chicago. Picture number six, video footage showed crowds of people ransacking an Apple store, making away with tablets and iPhones. Around 100 people stole items from Lululemon. Video footage showed officers trying to make arrests as looters exited stores. Authorities were investigating reports of a caravan of vehicles in Philadelphia, going from location to location, uh, ransacking uh, malls and shopping centers uh, and downtown shopping areas. Walmart, Target, CVS, uh, Walgreens are closing hundreds of stores. This has never happened before. Just in Portland, Oregon alone, six uh, super Walmarts uh, have shut down. I mean, imagine that. We take for granted they're open in El Paso, they're open here. Uh, imagine going to your local Walmart and it's boarded up with plywood. Uh, they are out of business uh, because they're losing too much money from the looters and the violence and their employees are no longer safe. Jesus said, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of money will grow cold. One article said, why is shoplifting so rampant in California? Because state law holds that stealing merchandise worth $950 or less is a misdemeanor, which means that law enforcement isn't going to bother to investigate, no arrests will be made, no fines will be issued, and prosecutors will just simply let it go. This is the lawlessness that Jesus talked about. And there's the attack on the family that's going from bad to worse. In the era that I got saved in the mid-70s, divorce was kind of a big deal. Fatherlessness, abandonment, abortion, all of those things were in the infancy of being propagated over our society and our culture. Now they're all normalized, but it hasn't stopped. It's escalating. The pushing of immorality, violating God's created order, child, gender, surgery and modification drugs uh, and surgical procedures pushed uh, on minors, minors. Picture number seven uh, was a recent article on the Drudge Report. Uh, Planned Parenthood is helping teenagers transition uh, after a 30-minute consult. Uh, the abortion provider is now wading into the transgender care, doling out prescriptions for estrogen and testosterone, uh, including uh, to special needs kids. Laws in California and Washington Parents must recognize their minor children's desire to transition or the children can be taken away by the government from the home. Parents cannot interfere with minors who decide they want to seek gender affirming care. So let me talk with you about the warning. Because our text contains one of the more sobering statements that Jesus made, if I could draw you into it for a moment. And I want you to try to get a feel for the intensity with which he's communicating this to you, to myself. Because it's our generation in which the Jesus is coming. Jesus said, take heed to yourselves. Why would he say that? He said that because of the likelihood that many are going to be distracted, not paying attention, weighted down, as he said, with the cares of this life, asleep, oblivious, unaware. And that could be some of you here tonight. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighted down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life and that day comes upon you unexpectedly. Unexpected because you're not looking for it. The pursuit of money, the pursuit of education, the pursuit of success in this life, all good. 
I don't oppose. I want people in my church to prosper uh, and their businesses to do well. Uh, but this better be on top of all that. The Amplified Translation says be on guard so that your hearts are not weighted down and depressed uh, with the giddiness of debauchery and the nausea of self-indulgence uh, and the worldly worries of life. And then that day when the Messiah returns uh, will not come to you suddenly like a trap. In Matthew 25, we have a powerful picture of the church. It is very sobering. It's the parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. Verse 1 of that chapter, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five were wise and five were foolish. Now, that's the church. The church comprises illustratively of these ten virgins. They're getting ready to be part of a wedding. Their role is to prepare. The bridegroom has gone to make ready. And at a point in time, unknown to the virgins, but known to the bridegroom, he's going to come and get them and they have to be ready. They have to be looking. They have to be alert. They have to be prepared. All ten know the bridegroom is going to come in theory, as many of God's people know. Yeah, Jesus is coming. I believe that. But the Bible says that the bridegroom delayed. And that triggered something in the foolish virgins. They started messing around. Getting distracted. Getting diverted. The other five wives were ready. Stayed alert. And were prepared for him to come at any moment. With the five wise virgins, there's an urgency. The five foolish virgins, there's no urgent anticipation of the bridegroom coming. And then the five wise virgins said, he's going to come. You got no oil. Well, give us some of yours. No, you got to prepare for yourself. And the Bible says, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, surely I say to you, I don't know you. Five wise, five foolish. Does that mean, Jesus uses numbers for a reason. Does that mean that half the church is not going to be taken up in the rapture? I think at the very least it means a significant number of people who claim to be Christians are not in any way ready. Now, I don't think that's true in our fellowship, so don't panic. It's not this half going in the rapture and that half staying behind. God willing, we're all going. But I think it's certainly true in the religious world. A lot of churches are going to be half empty. Or more when the rapture comes. That's why Jesus is speaking with such intensity and urgency. Uh, Matthew 24, 42. Watch therefore. For you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. Pay strict attention is what he's saying. The idea is that we're on alert. We're looking. We're animated by. And we're aware of Jesus' imminent return, and it's affecting how we live. Watch, therefore, and pray always uh, that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come on the earth. When was the last time you prayed like that? He said, pray always. God, I want to escape. I want to be right with you. I mentioned this morning how my habit in driving to prayer meeting those 13 minutes uh, is to speak in tongues, uh, get my heart uh, 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 primed to talk to God and to pray, and then I repent. Uh, God, forgive me. Uh, I let go of any blunder, mistake, error, misspoken word, uh, thought, or imagination uh, that I may have had in the last 24 hours that did not align with your virtue, Lord, and forgive me. That's how he's suggesting we pray. Watch. And pray always. Is that a part of your daily prayer life? Are you doing that? 
being ready for his coming requires that we watch, we're aware, we're alert, we're animated by the potential coming of the Lord at any moment, and we're praying always to be in readiness for that event. Let me ask you in this way. Have you given any thought, let's just say in the last 48 hours, to the fact that Jesus could come at any moment? And did it affect you in any way? If you don't think about it, if you haven't thought about it, if it's not a regular part of your life and what you anticipate, how can you possibly be ready? Wedding's coming. It's on the mind of the bride from the moment of her engagement. And she's ready and she's prepared and she's getting everything buttoned up and she's talking and calling and making arrangements because she's looking forward to the event. How can you be ready if it's not on your mind? If it's not on your mind, that's how we get involved in conflict and unforgiveness and resentments and distractions and diversions, start missing church in order to make money, start going hither and yon in order to pursue something, quitting ministry, dropping out, spotty church attendance, no prayer, rarely reading our Bible daily devotionally. We're drifting because we're not watching and we're not praying always. So let me close by talking to you about the necessity of watching. This is not something that you can be passive about. There's no more important feature of your life and it's twofold. Being ready yourself takes work and diligence and effort. You got to make right choices and right decisions. This life is not all there is. That's why Jesus said, beware of covetousness, uh, that you don't think that this life is all there is uh, and begin to make your decisions based on that and you go astray. And I think that's where a lot of God's people are today. Being ready yourself and helping others get ready. Paul is thinking about this, sitting in a prison cell. 2 Timothy 4, 7, the amplified version of this familiar verse. I have fought the good fight and worthy a noble fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, firmly guarding the gospel against error. In the future, there is reserved for me a, a victor's crown of righteousness uh, for being right with God and doing right, uh, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that great day. Uh, and not to me only, but also to all those who love his appearing uh, and long and welcome his appearing. You know why he's ready? Because he's thinking about it. It's on his mind. Jesus is coming. I'm going to stand before him and I'm going to give an account of my life and I've got to make preparation for that. It's our job as pastors to help people make preparation. That's why I think God inspired me last week to sound the alarm and make a declaration. Jesus is coming very soon and how much sooner because of the events that are rapidly playing out now should get all of our attention. So how should we be living in anticipation of his soon coming? First of all, we need to be patient. It's not a passive kind of waiting, but it's an expectant waiting, like the example I just used. The bride and the bridegroom need to be patient. The wedding's going to come, and then you can do everything that married couples do, but you've got to be patient. Just wait. The bride is so anxious. She's so nervous, the groom. But they patiently wait until the appointed moment, the appointed day comes. It's a waiting for us that involves preparing for the greatest event of all time in human history that is going to occur. Romans says, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Wake up. It's high time to awake out of your slumber, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. God is not slow to fulfill his promise, but he's patient 
2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but he's long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I had a thought when I was putting this part of the sermon together. I wonder tonight if there's one individual somewhere on earth today that when that person gets saved, when they bow their knee and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, the trumpet's going to sound. And God is going to say, okay, and I wonder, I know this is a wild harebrained way of thinking, but I can be accused of that from time to time. And I wonder if any of you know that person. And when they bow their knee and they repent and they give their lives to Christ, the Lord is going to say, okay, that's it. It's time for me to bring the church home and to allow the final events of the last days to begin to play out. James said, therefore, be patient, brethren. Until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. He's writing to a church. They're anxious. They thought Jesus was going to come in their lifetime. And he's not coming and they're freaking out. And he's got to be patient. Secondly, we need to live a lifestyle of repentance. And I talked about this this morning. Part of preparing for his soon coming. Is being as thoroughly right with God as we can be. Do you appreciate that the most important piece of real estate in your life is not where you live. That's important, your home. It's not where you work. It's not where you buy your groceries. The most important real estate is this altar. This little patch of carpet here in your beautiful uh, brand new building, uh, more will be achieved in your life uh, that will advance the will of God uh, at this altar, this little piece of real estate here, than any other piece of real estate in your life. This is where we prepare. This is where we repent. Uh, This is where we live uh, a repentant lifestyle. uh, And every opportunity we have, uh, we get as thoroughly right with God as we can. We're not perfect. We can't be sin free and mistake free, but let's not leave any known unfinished business. Hebrews says in 928, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Repent when you do wrong. Forgive when you're offended. Love at all times. Prioritize the things of God. If something uh, that you're doing is pulling you away from church and ministry, uh, let it go. Put Jesus first. He'll meet your need. We're too close to judgment day. We're too close to the trumpet sounding. James says, do not complain against one another. Believers. So that you will not be judged for it. The judge is standing right at the door. This was part of Jesus' warning in verse 36. Keep alert at all time. Be attentive and ready. Praying that you may have the strength and the ability to be found worthy. To escape all these things that are going to take place. And stand in the presence of the Son of Man at his coming. And then thirdly, we need to live. This may be the most important thing I say. We need to live as though today is the day. Isn't that Jesus' point? That if you don't live as though today is the day, you might get careless. You might get distracted. You might get weighted down with the cares of this life. The rapture of the church, the fulfilling of the events that we're seeing fulfilled right now in our daily newspapers should cause us to be extremely and acutely expectant. But Jesus said many are going to be caught off guard. They're not ready. They're not planning. They're not preparing. They're not thinking. They're not living their lives as though this could be the day. First thought in the morning. 
This could be the day, Lord, you come. First Thessalonians four, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of an archangel. And with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. He's talking to a church and he's trying to sound the alarm for them to be prepared and ready. And how much more for you and I. How much more. For you and I, this is the most exciting time to be alive. My son in law or daughter, if you would call them right now, I got Carrie on FaceTime. They were walking to their church building for their service tonight. Yolanda and Richard were in the office looking at her. They're walking to church. You know, there's tension in the air, but you don't see it on them. They feel safe. They had a family for the first time go to their church service tonight and get saved and give their lives to Christ in the middle of all this turmoil. And you know what that reminded me of? That reminded me of what it says in the book of Joel that Peter repeated that in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh or what are the last days the last days uh, are perplexity of nations and distress uh, and men's hearts failing them for fear uh, and wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes uh, in diverse places uh, that's the last days but in the midst of all that uh, he'll pour out his spirit upon all flesh uh, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord uh, shall be saved we are looking for the greatest revival uh, in the history of the world uh, in the run up to Jesus coming again and that's what we are praying for today. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Nobody moving around for a moment. I had called Pastor Ruby early Saturday morning, which I never do, and it probably alarmed him. He probably thought something went wrong, but I wanted to ask him if he'd heard the news about Israel, and he said no, and so I filled him in as best I could. He came to the office. I guess he looked into it a little bit more and he told me that he walked into your prayer meeting and he stopped the prayer meeting and, and made an announcement that he had just gotten a call from me that Israel is under attack and he asked prayer, I think, for Bob and Kerry. And he said when he did that, the prayer meeting got animated. A, 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 a spiritual dimension was loosed into that prayer meeting. Sounding the alarm, beloved, should initiate passionate prayer before our God in heaven passionate repentance so that we can be as surely right with God as we can be. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, perhaps you've come to this great service tonight, you're in this great conference and you're not right with God. You don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have not yet been born again. But as I'm talking about these matters the alarm is sounding you're not right with God and you know it it just so happened that when I preached this in my Sunday morning sermon this last Sunday morning we had 10 or 12 people that were there visiting and there were more I think but got saved we had people praying from one end of the altar to the other doomsday anxiety people that are not saved or troubled by what's happening in the world and what a perfect opportunity to bring the gospel of hope and peace and joy and forgiveness and love. It's going to resonate. If you go to work tomorrow and take a newspaper and show them what's happening, show them the Bible and tell them that there's a God in heaven who has everything under control and he can help them and forgive their sin. You watch. This could be the greatest opportunity to see souls saved. People know that there's distress of nations with perplexity. They're fearful, they're anxious, they're nervous, they're drugging and alcoholing and cocaining their lives into oblivion because they want to forget, they don't want to face it. What a perfect environment for our witness and our testimony, for people that have no fear. We have an anticipation mixed with joy this is the most exciting time to be alive. And perhaps you're here 
and you're not right with God, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have not yet been born again. But you really want to be. You want to know Jesus. You want to have what I have. You know you're a sinner. You know that. You know you need forgiveness. You know you need to change, but you can't. You don't know how. Whosoever is in Christ, the Bible says, is a new creation. That can be you tonight. And as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. I would like the honor and the privilege of being able to pray for you tonight. That would be the highlight of this service. For one or two or more, many more, to say, I need Jesus, I'm not right with God. And I wanna repent, I wanna tell God I'm sorry for my sin. You know, every time I give an altar call, whether it's in a conference setting, my own church, a pioneer church, a discipleship class, every time I give an altar call, I feel an urgency in that altar call like I'm the one sitting out there that the preacher needs to appeal to. I remember what it was like when Pastor Warner would give those passionate altar calls uh, uh, when I first got saved. I remember the altar call he gave when my wife gave her life to Christ. And maybe that's you tonight. You're not right with God, but you want to get right. I can help you. I can pray for you. We were once where you are now, broken, without hope, and desperate in our lives. In my mid-teenage years, I became an alcoholic and a drug addict. But the day that I prayed to receive Jesus, the curse of sin was broken and I became a new man in Christ. And that can be your testimony tonight. So as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if that describes you, I want you to do one thing for me. Nobody's looking. I want you just to lift your hand. Pastor, pray for me. God bless you. God sees that hand. God bless you, young lady. God sees that hand. Anyone else? God bless you, son. I see that hand. Thank you. Anyone else tonight, lift your hand right up. God bless you, I see that hand, thank you. God bless you, young man, I see that hand. There are children that are eight, nine years old, perhaps that are lifting their hands, they can be saved tonight. They hear the message, they can know something's going on. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come to me. Anyone else tonight, lift your hand right up. Pastor, pray for me, I wanna get my heart right with God. God bless you, I see that hand, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, lift your hand right up. Let's do this quickly tonight. Maybe you're backsliding. This is not a good time to backslide. No time is. What if you backslide and the rapture comes? What then? The tribulation, you know what's gonna happen. Why would you jeopardize being taken up to meet the Lord in the air for sin, for foolishness? God bless you, son. I see that hand, thank you. Anyone else? God bless you, I see that, thank you. Anyone else tonight, lift your hand right up. God bless you, my brother. God bless you, sister, I see that hand. Anyone else tonight, lift your hand right up. In Jesus' name, this is gonna be an altar where we get as surly right with God as we can. It's an altar of repentance. It's an altar where we're gonna do what Jesus said, watch and pray always that you be counted worthy to escape. God, I wanna escape, therefore I repent. Amen, God bless you, I see those hands, thank you. If you lifted your hand, God bless you, son, I see that hand. If you lifted your hand, I want you just to get up out of your seat right now and come and find a place to pray. If you're a parent and your son or your daughter raise their hand, you bring them tonight and you lead them to Christ and you pray for them in Jesus' name. Make sure someone is praying with everyone who's coming. I need some brethren to come covered in hidden sin is not gonna be concealed before the eyes of whom with which we have to do. Jesus Christ, as I mentioned, doesn't hate you because of your sin. He loves you all the more. He hates what the devil's doing to you. And he'll accept you back, receive you to himself. Now I know it sounds a little alarmist, a little hyperbolic when I said half the church is not going to make the rapture, but I didn't make up the parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. Jesus said that. And I wonder how many of you needed the alarm to sound. We get distracted, we get diverted. 
We get caught up in the affairs of this life and the cares of this world. We all have responsibility. We have jobs. We have families. Uh, we have to pay attention to what God's doing, what's going on around us. I'm not suggesting put on a robe, climb to a mountain, and wait for the coming of the Lord. We have to be responsible uh, citizens. But this needs to override everything. My decisions are going to be based on getting ready for the coming of the Lord. I don't want to be found compromising, so caught up with this world that I can't be in church, can't serve in ministry, can't be fully invested in the work of God. The Titanic has struck the iceberg. What should we be doing? We should be involved in preparing ourselves to survive and flourish and helping others. And maybe you're guilty of falling asleep and being distracted. Maybe you're one of those that really hadn't thought about this. Sounding the alarm, that was my burden for my Sunday morning sermon. And how much louder is that alarm sounding since the events that began Saturday morning in Israel? Jesus is saying, look up for your redemption draws. Now, I think we all need to find a place at the altar. Let's all stand a place to come and get as surly right with God as we can. It's an altar of repentance, an altar of preparation, an altar where we watch and we make a commitment, Lord, I am going to make this a feature of my prayer life every day, praying always that we might be counted worthy to escape. Jesus said we need to be doing that. Cry out to God. Jesus is well pleased tonight when we preach like this, when you respond the way that you're responding. He's returning for a church that is waiting and ready and expectant and longing for him to come. Oh, Oh, Lord, I pray for fire to fall from heaven. Consume us, O oh God, with your love and with the riches of your mercies. Oh, God, oh, God, pour out your spirit. I pray for a great revival of prayer, a great revival of brokenness and desperation. Oh, Oh, God, we praise you, love you, exalt you, glorify you, worship you. He is coming back again. He's coming back again. My Jesus is coming back again. Lord, I thank you. I praise you. morning I glorify you. I worship you. Let's give God praise tonight. Hallelujah. Yo, Rada Ravila Rabashari, Ada Ravila Rabakorio. 
Laramando Riala Ravila Rabba Shah Riala Ravila Rabba Korea Korea Riala Ravila Rabba Shah Riala Ravila Rabba Korea Yanda Rada Ravila Rabba Korea One at a time, son. Yes, my word says, as a thief in the night, yes, as a thief in the night, in an hour in which you least expect, the yea, I have given you the warning, I have given you the signs, and they are bound. Yea, but I have given you all that you need to be equipped and be prepared. I have given you my church. I have given you your pastor. I have given you these things that you may be equipped for the work of the ministry. And as it is, as you work in the ministry and as you put your hand to the plow and do not look back, yet even in this moment, if you would live as if they, this day is the day, if you would live your life this way, I've prepared you I've equipped you with all that you need to be focused, on, not only to be focused, but be fruitful unto my glory. Abide in me as my son said, and you shall bear much fruit, and this fruit will bring much glory to me. I shall come as a thief in the night. You must be prepared, and I am calling upon you this night like never before. Oh, be Armando. To be focused. And to bear the fruit that I've ordained and destined you to bear. And I have equipped you. And you have been equipped. And you have all that you need at your disposal. I've empowered you with my Holy Spirit. I've given you the equipping and the power and the tool of prayer. Seek my face. And seek my power. And seek my anointing. And bear the fruit in these final hours that I have called you to bear, thus says the Lord. Hallelujah.
Things are escalating. 300,000 Israeli troops, 300,000 Israeli troops, sounds like an Old Testament army, have laid siege to Gaza. They're going to go in. When that happens, today, tonight, tomorrow, the next day, very soon, that's going to occur. That's going to rattle the entire world. And I believe that the scripture that your pastor used uh, Sunday morning, uh, uh, Zechariah chapter 12, that Israel is going to be a troublesome stone to all people. Uh, the tide is going to turn against Israel uh, worldwide. It's already turning uh, to some degree. But the support that some people have offered thus far is going to crumble and they're going to be crying out against Israel for overreacting and overreaching. And then I don't believe Hamas would have done what they did without knowing that Iran and Russia and their other allies will come to their aid eventually. So you keep your eye on the news. You keep your eye on Jesus coming again. You keep your eye on this piece of real estate right here. If you're called to preach, you better do everything you can to get sent out as soon as possible. Talk to your pastor this week. I wouldn't want to stand before God having been called to preach and I never got around to it. I kept delaying and putting it off and not taking it seriously. And then the rapture comes and I never fulfilled my calling. You better get serious. We need to do as much as we can as soon as we can in the run up to Jesus coming again. Let's give God praise as pastor comes.